Hello lovely people, today I have a bit of a mammoth haul for you. Sophie Vlogs! Today I'm essentially hauling all of the books that I've bought since about October November time. This can roughly be split into three categories, that is Christmas books, queer books, and assorted other. That's kind of moving backwards in time, which I bought them. I'm just going to dive in and crack on, because there's quite a lot to cover, so I should probably get going. First up is Gathering Moss by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I read Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer in November, and I absolutely adored it, so I knew I wanted to ask for this for Christmas. It's all about moss. I love moss. I'm so excited to learn more about moss. I'm aware this is niche, but I'm so here for it. Um, also, another reason why I asked for this is one of my favourite booktubers and all-round lovely person, Olive, over at Book Olive, recently did a video where she matched up uh, fiction and non-fiction books. I really like those types of videos. I've done one myself. I will link hers down below as well as mine. Um, but she mentioned this book alongside Sea People by Christina Thompson, which I read also in November, which is sort of um, looking back at, like, tracing the history of our understanding of um, Polynesian um, sort of voyaging and that sort of thing. And she matched it with The Signature of All Things by Elizabeth Gilbert. And she said that the three books um, really inform each other in a really interesting way. So after hearing that and knowing I was going to ask for this, felt like I kind of had to ask for this as well. This follows uh, Alma Whitaker. Her passion for botany leads her far from home, from London to Peru to Tahiti, in pursuit of that rare specimen, knowledge. I think that this is going to be so interesting. I have this real, like, interest in sort of, like, um, botany and more like the process of, like, understanding botany and sort of, like, in a historical context. I don't know. It's one of those niche little areas that I've only recently started really to, like, dip my toe into, and I really enjoy books that explore that. And I think that that's what this is going to be. This is, of course, fiction. This is non-fiction. But I'm planning on reading both of these fairly soon because I think it's going to be, like, a really interesting, like, informative reading moment. Death in Spring by uh, Mose Rodereda, translated from the Catalan by Martha Tennant. This one's on my radar because of Matt at MCS Books. In my mission to read more translated fiction, um, Matt, as well as being a lovely friend, is also a really great resource for translating fiction um, and I've never read any Catalan books before and so I just really wanted to change that. As soon as he talked about this on his channel I was like I really need to pick this up and read it. It's described as being a dark and dreamlike tale of a teenage boy's coming of age in a remote village in the Catalan mountains um, and it's sort of his father dies and he has to like sort of navigate this like oppressive society on his own but it's described as being often seen as an allegory for life under dictatorship death in spring is a bewitching and unsettling novel about power exile and the hope that it comes from even the smallest gestures of independence and this is just one that i'm really really excited to read and i'm really excited to sort of get a better perspective on like catalan literature editing sophie here just diving in because i realized i forgot to include another book that my partner got me this is a collection by Neo marsh she is a very famous new zealand crime fiction writer this is a collection of uh, the Inspector Allen mysteries. I only asked for the first one just to give her, um, like, to try her out a bit because I've never read her before. Um, a Man Lay Dead is um, sort of about this guy who holds these, like, murder mystery parties where, like, someone dies and they all have to figure out who does it, except for this time, someone actually dies. I first heard about her from um, Olivia Savannah from Olivia's Catastrophe, and I've been wanting to read a bit more um, detective murder mystery. I read some, like, police procedural style things recently, and I've just realised they're not really my thing, and I prefer, like, a detective solving things type crime. My partner very kindly got me this collection, so I have three of her books to check out. Um, that's A Man Lay Dead, Enter a Murderer, The Nursing Home Murder, and then I think there's an extra bonus story, plus bonus story, Moonshine. So I'm really excited to sort of explore a new crime right On two books that other people gave me for Christmas. Um, last year I asked for, like, experiences. That's not really possible this year, so I pretty much exclusively received books because they're very easy to post. <laughs> So my mum, very kindly, I only asked for the first book in this trilogy, but she bought me all three of the Inheritance Trilogy by N.K. Jemison. You may know, I did not stop talking about how much I loved the Broken Earth series in 2020, so um, I'm so excited to explore another N.K. Jemison series. Um, this starts with The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms, then The Broken Kingdoms, and then Kingdom of God. I believe this is more fantasy, whereas this season was sort of like fantasy sci-fi mixed. I know that this is to do with um, this kingdom called Sky. There are sort of gods um, sort of involved here, and I really like sort of fantasy that has like gods present in text. I'm realizing that that's kind of like a thing that I'm really intrigued by. 
Um, and I know that um, the main character in this is named one of the potential heirs to the king, but the throne of the Hundred Thousand Kingdoms is not easily won, and then she's thrust into like this vicious power struggle. And this has a lot of things which like tick boxes of things that I like. And N.K. Jemison, I feel at this point I want to read everything she's ever written, so I'm super duper excited to read these, and I feel very blessed to have all three, rather than just the first one. It's very, very kind and sweet. Moving on to my dad. Long-time viewers will remember that my dad always buys me a 2000 AD collection. This time, it's Slain the Demon Killer collection. 2000 AD is a comic in the UK. They always have Judge Dredd in it, but every issue is like a mix of different um, stories in each one. And uh, these 2000 AD collections take like different runs of those stories, and they like bind them up into one. I've previously read the Horned God run of Slain. This is Demon Killer. This is actually like three different runs bound together in one. He's essentially like this very fierce warrior, and um, previous ones have been very like rooted in sort of like Irish myth and stuff like this. So the main comic in this is sort of like Slain teaming up with Boudicca, which was interesting. I have read this and it will be popping up on a book chat soon, so I will stop talking about it because I'll just do a wrap up at some point. He also got me, <laughs> tapping into one of my 2021 goals, King Arthur's Britain, a, phot a photographic odyssey by John Matthews and Michael J. Stead. So this is non-fiction, um, and it's sort of, <laughs> as the title might suggest, a geographical odyssey, so it's looking at, like, the, the geographical places that are associated with King Arthur. So there's lots of photographs in this, lots of big photographs, it's exploring um, all the different places that are associated with Arthurian myth, and sort of, like, just unpicking their associations, and, like, the histories, and that sort of thing. I think that this is going to be super interesting, because I did say that I want to explore Arthurian literature more this year, but this is a really interesting take on that with, like, okay, well, like, grounding it in place, and grounding it in, like, how do the different myth strands tie into different places and stuff like that, so I'm super duper excited for that. My lovely friend Mark, who is also a podcast co-host, our podcast is linked in the description down below, always, in case you fancy a listen, he sent me two books that I am very intrigued by. First up is um, Girls Against God by Jenny Fowl. This is on my radar because I have seen a couple of people talk about this, specifically Anna Marie over at um, Actual Spinster, um, so it's one of those books that I was kind of like vaguely aware of. Um, and then when it arrived, I was like, ooh, now I get to see what I think. This is set in small town Norway. The description says, um, white picket fences run in strict roads and strict white Christian values run deep. Here a teenage woman gives in to the lure of rebellion offered by the upstart black metal scene. Um, she moves to Oslo. Um, there's just a, <laughs> to be honest with you, um, it's described as a radical fusion of feminist thought and experimental horror and a unique treaty on magic, writing, and art. This sounds so unlike anything I've ever read that I, I simultaneously like don't really know what to expect and I'm also highly intrigued. I know that Mark bought this for me because he read it and he doesn't really know how he feels about it so he wants me to read it so we can have a conversation about it. So I always find those types of things really interesting because I really like having like um, conversations. Sometimes it can be really productive when you sort of have mixed feelings on stuff to have like interesting discussions on them so I'm really intrigued by this and I don't really know what to expect. He also got me a non-fiction book that is Left Bank, Art, Passion and the Rebirth of Paris 1940 to 1950 by Agnes Poirier. This sounds, again, super duper interesting. So this is focusing on a number of different voices like Norman Mailer, Miles Davis, Simone de Beauvoir, James Baldwin, Juliette Greco, Alberto Giacometti, Saul Bellow, and Arthur Kostler. And it's kind of looking at um, that time post world, the post World War II, when all of these people were like convened in Paris and were having all of these like radical thoughts and that sort of stuff, and sort of trying to, you know, like responding against the war with like different ways of thinking and stuff like that. It's a time period that I kind of like vaguely familiar with, but really don't know in any great depth. So I'm kind of excited just to just just like discover more. So thank you, Mark. My lovely friend Anna sent me in the post. Um, Midnight Chicken and Other Recipes Worth Living For by Ella Risbridger. It was really funny because <laughs> I'm vegetarian and she wrote in her little thing, she was like, she was like, I know it sounds like a weird title to send to a vegetarian, but it is the most comforting writing. And personally, like, uh, I love food writing of all kinds. I don't have to actually eat the food that I'm reading about. Um, but she said that this is just like the most comforting thing. 
she read it during the first lockdown when everything was very very stressful and she said that it was the most comforting and soothing thing to read and I find food writing to be so comforting and soothing in general so this is one that is going to be one that I kind of dip in and out of and savour I think but I'm really excited. The final Christmas books are ones I got given a voucher so I used it to specifically purchase these. Starting with an absolutely beautiful edition that to be honest with you because I recently did that whole series about book design that I love and naked hardbacks and stuff when I saw this I was like hello we've got to. This is The Mystery of the Blue Train by Agatha Christie. I mentioned in October that I really wanted to read some Agatha Christie but I had run out of Agatha Christie that I haven't read yet so I did a reread instead. I've never read The Mystery of the Blue Train, I don't actually know a lot about it but this <laughs> and then if I open it I'll look at the end papers but it has a very intriguing quote on the back which is you could perhaps love a thief mademoiselle but not a murderer so I think this is a Poirot um, and I don't really want to know too much more about it because I want to go in blind because that's what I love about Agatha Christie she always manages to keep me on my toes and really delight me so I'm super excited and I'm hopefully going to prioritise that one very soon um, I also got Two Trees Make a Forest by Jessica J. Lee on Memory, Migration and Taiwan. This is on my radar because of my friend Miriam. Um, I'll leave a link to her blog down below. This is um, nature writing, but also part nature writing, part memoir. Jessica J. Lee is piecing together the fragments of her family's history as they moved from China to Taiwan and then on to Canada. So she's um, sort of navigating both nature writing about Taiwan and tracing her family history and I love those memoirs that do that so you're following like someone's deeply deeply personal story alongside like exploring a topic um, and I previously said I wanted to read more nature writing that's beyond just sort of like my familiar corner of the world so this sounds absolutely wonderful and I'm really excited to dip my toes in and then finally on the Christmas books I also picked up The Cell of Dark by Caleb Rorig I keep saying that I really want to read more vampires and this was mainly sold to me as like gay vampires so I was like I'm here for it. This follows our main character August who lives in this town that is like a vampire town and then this really hot boy comes to town who is also a vampire. Essentially like stuff's going down, August ends up being like the only person who can like save the world I think and then there's also like this gay little love story with him and the vampire. So I just I really wanted to read more vampire fiction and I was like where better to kick back off with some gay vampires. Next up is a run of queer books. Um, specifically, I got all of these from Queer Lit, which is a Manchester-based bookshop. Initially, I did my own order from Queer Lit, where I spent my own money, and then also I entered a Twitter competition, and I actually won a voucher to spend there um, from this very lovely woman. I will link her Twitter down below. She is also an author. She's written a book called Charrington Academy, which is a YA book about this boy going to the school, Charrington Academy. A bit of, like, friendship drama but also like a gay love story and that sort of thing I also picked up her book so as just like a thank you <laughs> so I will link her down below in case you want to check out that but this is a mix of both uh, queer fiction and non-fiction I'll start off with the fiction and then I'll move on to the non-fiction again in the vampire vein I picked up The Deathless Girls by Kieran Millwood Hargrave I love this cover so much I think it's so stunning and beautiful this is about the three wives of Dracula so the wives of Dracula are sort of like vaguely mentioned in the Dracula story but then they've sort of taken on this life of their own I think where they've been featured in some of like the film adaptations and stuff like that this book is sort of like looking at like their origin story and it's like imagining an origin story for them I know that it's also a bit queer because it's all <laughs> being sold on the queer lit shop so uh, again trying to explore vampires but I was like I could just make sure they're all queer though couldn't I <laughs> yes I also picked up Under the Udala Trees by Chinello Ogparanta. This is one that's been on my radar for a really long time and I um, have been wanting to read it for so long. It's set during the Nigerian Civil War. It follows two characters, one of them is Hauser and one of them is Igbo. And although they should be mortal enemies, they form this friendship and I'm assuming it's going to grow into something more. Um, I recently, I had already bought this, but then also um, Bookish Realm also mentioned this in her video of talking about um, books that aren't talked about enough on booktube and it was like a little reminder and I was like yes I really want to prioritise reading this because I've heard so many good things about this I'm expecting because it's set during the Nigerian Civil War that it's not necessarily always going to be the lightest thing so I'm really going to save it for a time where I feel like I can really dedicate time to it and appreciate it but I'm really excited to read this soon Onto my non-fiction, I bought a tiny little light one because it was cute and I couldn't help it. This is The Little Book of Pride. It has rainbow sprayed edges. How could I not? I think it's just a really sweet little like blipfer guide to pride. And I thought, hey, 
it's sweet and I want to read it. Slightly chunkier, I also treated myself to Queer X Design by Andy Campbell. This is another one that I've been wanting to read for so long. This is like tracing queer history but through specific like graphic design. So the obvious example is Gilbert Baker, the original Rainbow Flag, but um, it kind of goes through history and looks at like icons and designs and stuff like that and like the history behind them and I'm really excited for this because there are some um, sort of design pieces that I feel like I'm really familiar with, like silence equals death, stuff like that. But there's going to be a lot in here that is just going to be entirely new to me, and I'm hoping that it's going to shine spotlights on areas of history that I don't know anything about. So, super duper excited for this. I also picked up Trans Love, an anthology of transgender and non-binary voices edited by Freya Benson. I specifically wanted to get my hands on this one, not just because it's beautiful, but this is really, like, um, challenging the idea that trans people by coming out as trans um, you'll never be able to find love and stuff like this but it's sort of like this myth that's really harmful that I think is sometimes expelled or like feared and that sort of thing whereas this anthology is very explicitly all about love this is ex explicitly exploring like all of their different experiences of love it says it's specifically like familial romantic spiritual self-love friendships and allyships um, stuff like that. It's a broad and honest understanding of how trans people navigate love and relationships and what love means to them. I just think that I really love that idea as like a concept of the focus of this and it's hopefully going to introduce me to a lot of voices that I can then go off and search and, and read more of and stuff like that. So again, another one I'm really excited for. And then the final queer book is Life Isn't Binary on Being Both Beyond and In Between by Meg John Barker and Alex Yamtafi. This is specifically all about uh, non-binary experience. We're making an effort to read more trans books, either like fiction by trans authors or non-fiction about trans experience. But I sort of became aware that I feel like there's a bit of a gap in my reading that is like specifically like non-binary authors and non-binary experience. So I wanted to change that. Um, and I'm hoping this is going to be like a good step to do that. I only have a couple of books left to talk about. These are my assorted other. So in November, it was uh, mine and my partner's five year anniversary. And he got me two books. First of all is uh, Zami, A New Spelling of My Name, a biomythography by Audre Lorde. I read um, a collection of Audre Lorde's um, sort of speeches slash essays, uh, The Master's Tools, Whatever Dismantle the Master's House, and I was blown away. I thought she was saying brilliant, very worthwhile things, but also like her actual like style was so beautiful. So I, <laughs> it was like a reminder to self, read more Audre Lorde. This is her autobiography, and I just thought what better way to explore her further and get a better understanding of her and her life and then I can go forward and meet, read more of her writing after this. Also this cover like really feels like a science fiction novel and I'm very intrigued by it. He also got me As I Crossed a Bridge of Dreams, Recollections of a Woman in 11th Century Japan. This is by Lady Sarashina and then it's translated by Ivan Morris. So Lady Sarashina was born in AD 1008 at the height of the Heian period. I have been wanting to read more like older classic texts from cultures that I just haven't really read their classic texts of. So this is on my radar because I know that it's uh, a very well-known piece of like Japanese writing and I just thought it sounds so interesting, specifically so interesting to read something from the perspective of a woman in this time. So I just thought it's a little dinky one but I'm super duper intrigued. I'm just hoping to explore more classics from different countries all over the world in general. If you have any recommendations please do let me know. Speaking of classics, I also picked myself up uh, Arthurian Romances by Chrétien de Troyes. Obviously the Arthurian tradition has like many threads that come from different places. Um, there is a whole French tradition of Arthuriana which I don't feel like I've really explored very fully. Um, and Chrétien de Troyes is such like an iconic <laughs> um, person in this like formation of these myths and specifically I know that the sort of Lancelot Guinevere uh, story ha comes from the French tradition. So this has um, the Knight of the Cart, The Knight with the Lion, uh, The Story of the Grail within it, and it also has like an introduction and stuff like this that is going to give me like a lot of context. These are texts that I have been aware of for a while that I have always meant to pick up, so I was just like, it's the year of Arthuriana for me, let's not only read modern retellings, but let's get more familiar with like these original source materials and stuff like that, so I'm super duper excited to check this out. Again, another Arthurian related book is I also picked up The Summer Tree by Guy Gabriel Kay, which is the first book in the Fionnavar Tapestry. I have read the Fionnavar Tapestry, but I don't own it. It's my dad's copies that I read. Um, this is a fantasy series about this group of um, university students who end up sort of um, going into this fantasy world and they have a real role to play in this big conflict that's going on in this world. So far, so Narnia. But um, it's very different. Um, there are some darker aspects to it, but one thing that I love about it is 
it's not an Arthurian retelling, but there is a strand of the plot line which does incorporate Arthurian myth, and I loved how they did it so much. It's been a very long time since I've read it, so I bought this because I want to do a reread of the series, just to like reassess as how I am now, do I still like it as much? But specifically, that Arthurian plot line, I loved it so much. Um, so again, I love Guy Gabriel Kay's fantasy in general, so I'm really excited to do a reread of this. The final book I have to talk about is the Land Where Lemons Grow by Helena Atley. This is tracing the history of Italy through citrus fruit. So it's looking at sort of the way in which citrus has um, had such a role in Italian history and that sort of thing. And it's kind of like looking at different areas and citrus fruit and stuff like that. This is again on my radar because of Matt and Miriam. I really like nonfiction that is like, let's look at food and social history and that sort of thing. So very excited to read that. Those are all the books I have to talk about. Bit of a beast. As per usual, I would really love to know if you've read any of these, what your opinions on them are, that sort of thing. If you have any recommendations based off of them, please do let me know, although I am pausing buying for a while because this is going to keep me in the reading for quite a while. Um, I hope you've had a really lovely week and I will see you next time for something different.